This religion has 50 million followers worldwide. It is a faith shrouded in secrets and mystery. The devoted embark on a divine quest mapped out by rituals. Secret and often bloody ceremonies which summon the dead. Voodoo. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On this program, we follow an American voodoo chief on a spiritual journey to Benin, Africa, where both as a witness and a participant, he reveals to us the secrets of ancient voodoo rituals. These sacred African ceremonies of purification, animal sacrifice, and spirit possession are rarely seen by the uninitiated. For believers, they reveal the mysteries of life and death. But to the Western world, they may always remain misunderstood and unexplained. Benin, a small country that borders Nigeria along Africa's western coast. Here, the people practice the voodoo religion and its mysterious rituals, first developed more than 5,000 years ago. The rituals that this man, an American voodoo priest, performed in Africa, elevated him to an even higher level within the priesthood. In 1998, these ceremonies took Chief Elishin Obejalaye Ifagbenro to realms of voodoo he didn't even know existed. His spiritual journey began more than 20 years ago in a remote village nestled in the swamps of South Carolina, about 65 miles south of Charleston. It's called Oyotunji. It was built by voodoo practitioners in the 1970s as a community where African Americans could go to rediscover their roots. Here the chief believes his future was foretold in a sacred voodoo ritual. In March 1976, Chief Elishin, then known as Yusuf Abdullah, first heard about the village from a friend. At the time, he was a business student at Talladega College in Birmingham, Alabama. The 25-year-old traveled there during his spring break to tour the village and learn more about his African heritage. It wasn't voodoo that I was attracted to at that time. It was more the message and the traditions. And when I really got deeper into that, I found out that it was a representation of ancestors. So I'm very much into looking into my roots and I hear this word ancestral. So that had something to do with why I moved toward these people. At the time, Yusuf had recently grown dissatisfied with his devotion to Orthodox Islam, a conversion he made from Christianity during college. I had reached a point in my life where I was disillusioned with what I was doing and I was searching for something different, another level of spiritual consciousness. But I didn't know exactly uh, what it would be. Yeah, 
When he first walked through Oyotunji, the young man felt a sense of belonging that he had been lacking. Yusuf was struck by the rituals, which were the core of daily life in the village. Oyotunji was modeled after the ancient Yoruba culture of Nigeria. It was, and still is, the only village of its kind in the U.S., a place where voodoo is a way of life. They live in opposition to mainstream American culture, which they believe fails to incorporate faith into daily life. There's a separate compartment for the spiritual aspect of your life, and then there's another compartment which would be the mundane or the secular aspect of your life. Um, the African mind doesn't work like that, and there really isn't a division between the spiritual and the cultural in the African mind. The priests explain that within their sect of voodoo known as Orisha Voodoo, rituals were directed to harness a divine energy present in every living thing. They say in physics, you cannot destroy energy. Any energy can be transformed, but it cannot be destroyed. So we understand that if this is a divine energy, that it just goes from one stage or level to another and returns. This energy flows from one supreme god called Oludumare through a pantheon of lesser gods who represent various aspects of nature, like water and trees. Yusuf had never seen such pageantry displayed before him. He wanted to know more. The villagers told him he should stay the night and meet with their king the next day. That night, he slept beside a bonfire, listening to the ever-present drums, the spiritual heartbeat of the voodoo traditions. The drums are actually the voice of the deities. Each fragment of voodoo has its own type of beat. The people play a big part in that too, because they're the ones who get you to vibe, because you, you're playing the voice of the gods and you're giving it to the people. By noon on his second day in the village, Yusuf was summoned for a meeting with Oyotunji's king and high priest, Osejaman Adafunmi. Through one of voodoo's most profound rituals, the king read into Yusuf's distant past. As shown here, this West African divination ritual entails the use of sacred objects to contact the god of destiny, known as Ifa, for revelations into a person's fate. We do believe in destiny, that everything uh, is, that happens is bound to happen, that uh, there are forces in the universe to which you can appeal and uh, there will be a response. As Yusuf was ushered into the king's presence, the king pulled out a chain, like this one, with eight palm nuts attached, considered a conduit of divine energy. The high priest chanted the incantations to the god of destiny as he raised the chain up and down and then threw it on the ground. At that moment, the king announced that he had an insight into a sad event in Yusuf's past, his father's untimely death. And that the reason Yusuf was restless and unhappy was that he had not recovered from that experience. I was awestruck to find out how could this person know anything about me and I've never met him. How could he know anything about my fat past unless I told him? So I was kind of like fascinated over him, what he was saying, and um, pretty much uh, was willing to listen. 
Then the king told Yusuf something else about his past, that he came from a long and distinguished line of voodoo priests. The king offered to train him to follow in his ancestors' footsteps. Yusuf, shocked and overwhelmed by the king's proposal, left the village uncertain about his future. They kept telling me, oh, you'll be back. That's what all the priests said. And I kept saying to myself, what are they talking about? I'll be back. Just a week later, he packed his bags, moved to Oyotunji, and yielded to what he now believed was his destiny, life as a voodoo priest. A total departure from everything he had known before. Learning your lessons is the most important thing in life, and the struggles that you go through in life, you learn from them, and you learn where you want to be and where you don't want to be. So I knew that Oyatunji was a place I could grow. I felt that when I came through that gate. Over the next 20 years, Yusuf Abdullah became known as Chifalashin Obajalaye Ifag Benro. Now the chief, a village elder, conducts rituals, like this one, where he and other villagers make an annual offering to the lost souls of the sea, their African ancestors who drowned on the passage to the New World during the slave trade. In June 1998, Chief Alashin would cross the Atlantic on his third journey to Benin. This trip would connect him to ancient voodoo mysteries not yet revealed to the Western world, rituals that would forever enrich his own life and that of his village. In June 1998, after more than 20 years as a voodoo priest, Chief Alashin Obajalaye Ifag Benro went on his third and most sacred trip to Africa. Here in Benin, the voodoo religion was exported on slave ships in the 18th century to the New World, including South America, the Caribbean, and the American colonies. On this journey, the chief attained a new knowledge of sacred rituals, which he would take back to his village in South Carolina. This trip was very, very uh, important because it opened up a totally different avenue of looking at Africa and voodoo. Having to go there and to go through some of the things that I was presented before this time really closed a missing link with who I am and what I, I'm to become. He would soon find himself traveling along a path that carried him deeper into the heart of voodoo rituals. On his first day, Chief Alashin toured Dank Topa Market in Cotonou, Benin's largest city. Here, the chief would be tested in his knowledge of the gods. Amid the fruit stands, he visited stalls filled with supplies unavailable in the U.S., objects needed to practice voodoo in its purest form. Locals grew curious when they learned that he was a high voodoo priest from America. When he told them he was able to communicate with the powerful god of destiny known as Ifa, one merchant quizzed him on his knowledge. After Chief Elishin gave him answers that only a high priest in Africa would know, he was accepted as an authentic priest. They identified with me, they identified with what I represented. I was given a 
a symbol of ancestral offering that a uh, python snake that young man wanted to give me. You know, I know I couldn't take it back with me, but that's symbolic. The next day, the chief left Cotonou for a place where few Westerners have ever gone, the Temple of the Serpents in Ouida. The python represents the voodoo god Dambala Wedo, the great snake. The skin it sheds represents a passing of the generations and serves as a reminder for the need to preserve voodoo traditions. What the individual is expressing precisely in, in, the, in, in looking at or venerating the animal is that the individual sees himself as that link on the chain of humanity. In venerating the snake, is to understand that my responsibility is to pass on a certain tradition onto my children. It was out of respect for this ancient code that Chief Elishin met with Dangbe, the head priest at the temple. Dangbe called on Ifa, the god of destiny, to seek assurance that the chief's visit to Benin would be a success. <laughs> Dangbe explains what he read in the oracles. That support would soon come. The following day, the American chief arrived at the compound of Voodoo's most preeminent priest, Dagbo Hunan Huna, for a blessing. These village guards in full regalia known as Zangbetos performed a welcoming ceremony for the chief. The chief entered the throne room and awaited the priest's counsel. Once Dagbo emerged, Chief Elishin bowed before him out of respect for his knowledge of the ancestors. It is a priest's calling to have a special connection with his ancestors. For voodoo believers, ancestors act as intermediaries with the gods. The ancestors occupy a very important position in voodoo because these are people who are in the other dimension of life. They are the invisibles. And because they are so sacred, they can see far into the future and far into the past. People will consult their ancestors to find out what the ancestors can see. Dogbo advised the chief that before he could receive his ancestors, he had to be cleansed. So he arranged a secret and powerful purification ritual, usually reserved for Benin's most respected leaders. It was really a refreshing experience that he offered to do that for me. And first sight, first meeting. So that was another ritual. So everything that you do takes you to a different level of the mysteries. In June 1998, Chief Elishin, an American voodoo priest from South Carolina, journeyed to Benin, Africa. This odyssey revealed to him voodoo mysteries beyond his greatest expectations. While boating through the village of Ganvier, the chief paid homage with a song to the Lord of Water, known as Olokun. 
Oni Okunabe Olori Enya Lodo Alache Alache Olokun Omo Mi Agro Olokun Olokun Achaba Olokun Olokun, Olokun, Ashaba, Olokun. From the very beginning of this momentous trip, he was led through a series of rituals to prepare him for a meeting with his ancestors. The last in the succession would be two of Voodoo's holiest, blood sacrifice and spirit possession. But first, he had to undergo water purification. On the third day, the chief was received by a high priest who arranged the ritual. He was told to disrobe and sit in front of a cauldron of boiling water. Yeah, that was a deep one there. I'd never gone through one quite like that one. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I'd never done it before, and I saw the boiling water. I'm looking at this man, stir this stick in this boiling hot pot of water. And, you know, I was looking for a bit of heat. Voodoo believers consider water to be a sacred element, containing divine energy, which can protect them from evil spirits. The rite of purification is a means of removing these spirits. If I'm going to be involved in a sacred activity, I therefore need to establish certain boundaries around myself to make it very clear that that area that I'm going to be performing this ritual is in fact going to be sacred ground. Yellow powder sprinkled on the ground around him confined the chief to the boundary. Here, the divine energy in the water could purify him. Sacred herbs were also used by the priest to prepare Chief Elishin to receive the water's power. The priest rubbed these herbs into the chief's hair and skin. It's very important that you always submerge yourselves in the sacred herbs of the deities so that when you go before them, that you're not impure, that you're physically not impure, mentally or spiritually, so that you can receive that energy. It's also understanding that the world doesn't exist separate from spirits, and that the spirits also are the life-giving powers that reside into the leaves themselves. So by using the leaves, I not only establish that interconnectedness with nature, but also with the spirits themselves, and therefore the world, because the spirits rule over the world. Chief Alashin had no idea what would happen next with the boiling water. He felt a sense of relief when he saw the priests allotted just enough time for the water to cool. Hot and cold stabilizes everything. So I think it, 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 it brought a bit of stability into my spirit. I felt a certain strength, I did. I felt that this was a real thing and that I was being protected by some unseen force. If you watch the faces of the people who do this, it's, it's quite clear that they are in a sense inwardly thinking about what is about to happen and what they are doing and preparing themselves to do something that's quite unusual, which is to deal with, uh, with spirits and to encounter the spirits. It's not washing oneself of any sin, but it is doing something that makes the individual understand that this is something that's very serious. one of those uh, mysteries, 
lot of mysterious things happen in this culture, and there are a lot of uh, mysteries and secrets that have not yet been un uh, told or even uh, realized. Now ritualistically cleansed, the chief was ready to make a sacred offering to his ancestors. In June 1998, on the fifth day of his trip to Benin, Africa, an American voodoo priest named Chief Alashin traveled north to the town of Dasa Zome. The region is a holy land to voodoo practitioners, known to locals as the Kingdom of the 41 Sacred Mountains. Here the chief, now purified, would perform voodoo's most divine ritual rarely seen or performed by Westerners, the blood sacrifice of a bull to his ancestors. He would then witness the mysterious phenomenon of spirit possession. But first the elders escorted him to a village where hundreds waited anxiously to see the American voodoo priest. I was nervous about everything at every point because I had never experienced it before. I'm like a stranger going into a cavern and that's what it was like. It was like going into a, a strange place and not knowing what to expect. The chief's presence here represented a transatlantic bridge between the voodoo traditions in Africa and those practiced in the U.S. There were so many beautiful vibrations coming from the elders that I was like overawed at their eminence. And I knew that there's a great deal of wisdom and knowledge there for me. On the path into the village where the ceremonies began, dozens of priestesses approached the chief and bowed before him. He joined them in their benedictions to glorify and summon the voodoo deities. Also present was the Keeper of the Scepter, a priest who carried what is said to be the symbol of voodoo's power. Before moving on to the sacrifice, they celebrated the power that enriched their lives. A force that would propel them to take the chief closer to the dead. After the dancing, the elders instructed the chief to follow the priest out of the village. Then they led him to a cave on a mountaintop where they chanted before a shrine. They alerted the spirits that an offering would be made to the chief's ancestors. Chief Alashin looked on as the elders prepared the Black Angus Bull and then slit its throat. Then the chief shared in a blood communion with the spirits. It is like a communion. So you're doing all of this, can you take it? 
can you receive what you're doing? Your body is like a receptacle, so it's a nourishment that goes on. It's an energizing effect. In a sacrifice, what you're doing for the spirits is to give the very best that you have. And the very best thing that you can give to the spirits, uh, the Vodouist would say, is the gift of life itself. To confirm that the life was received, the chief sought assurance from the dead. He wanted affirmation that his ancestors were pleased with the offering and with his presence in Benin. So Chief Alashin went to the center of Dasazome, where masked dancers known as the Agungun waited for him. It is here that the dancers would evoke his ancestors and take on their spirits. This is the ritual of spirit possession. Spirit possession consists of being, as the people say it, ridden like a horse. In other words, the belief is that the spirit enters the person's body and the person's persona becomes dissipated or removed from the person and in all intents and purposes, for all intents and purposes, the person becomes that spirit. So the person behaves like that, like that spirit, speaks like the spirit is imagined to speak. The drummers used the rhythm to call upon the spirits to possess the dancers. When the ancestors took hold, the dancers stood before the chief and gave him a message. They told him the meaning of this visit was that of a returning son who worked his way back to his origins. They elevated me. They gave me a sense of purpose and responsibility. And I'm responsible for myself, my own self-image, who I am, and what I represent to them, my ancestors. So they gave me my identity. They gave me title, wisdom, knowledge, patience, and all of those things that people really need to preserve their lives. Voodooists do not worship the dead. They revere they're dead, they have respect for them. It's respecting the whole notion that what I am is the result of thousands of others who have come before me. It's a sense of having that kind of historical depth that one would not find if, if there wasn't the belief in, in ancestors. Chief Alashin ended his visit to Dasa Zome on a mountain top with the region's royal elders. There he was accepted as a lost child of voodoo who had come home. Obalogun Corniel, one of the region's spiritual elders, explains. En gros, il a il a été élevé à des grades. Il est devenu, disons, s'il était capitaine avant, il est devenu commandant pour pour donner un exemple au terre à terre. Donc, euh, spirituellement, il a été élevé et sur le plan pratique, bon, il est devenu un chef supérieur à ce qu'il était. During his week in Benin, Chief Elishin Obajalaye Ifag Benro not only learned more about his African heritage, but also about what he needed to teach others to preserve the voodoo traditions at the Oyotunji village in South Carolina. What we're trying to do is re-harness our own cultural identity, our own cultural hegemony, our own traditions, our own customs, and to preserve them. From these shores along the slave coast, the chief would return to South Carolina with a new perspective of voodoo and 
himself. A knowledge he intends to share with others who practice voodoo in America. In June 1998, after spending a week in Benin, West Africa, the cradle of voodoo, Chief Elishin returned to the Oyotunji village in South Carolina. After attaining a higher level within the priesthood, he shared his knowledge of rituals with others. On July 8th, a young woman named Tanya came to the village to seek the chief's counsel. She told him she had fought depression for many years. Desperate for a cure, she requested help from the chief and agreed to participate in her first voodoo ritual. Tanya requested that her identity be concealed. I was scared at first because I didn't know what he was going to say. So basically I was kind of scared. But then as he started talking, I felt more comfortable and more relaxed because he knew what he was talking about. The ritual the chief prepared for Tanya was similar to that he would administer for any illness, psychological or physical. In voodoo, the devoted believe there are two types of cosmic energy at work in nature. That which is benevolent and that which is menacing. Illness of any sort is caused by too much negative energy. This is why we give reverence to all of these cosmic forces of energy that are around us, that we have to appease these forces in order to stay in harmony with them. They step before the chief's altar to drive the negative energy from Tanya's body and into a sacrificial chicken. With his chance, he evoked a positive energy to help drain Tanya of her illness. I couldn't even explain how it worked for me, but what he was doing, it really lifted me and my spirits. It made me a little better, a little more happier. To complete the ritual, the chief then advised Tanya to discard the chicken in the woods. The chicken symbolizes that I'm throwing away all my problems. And I plan on doing just what the chief said, and I'm not gonna look back. But beyond the rituals practiced by Chief Elishin and other voodoo followers, lies a legacy of fear and misunderstanding. Voodoo's sinister reputation as a cult which dabbles in devil worship and witchcraft was based on stereotypes sensationalized by Hollywood. Racial prejudice also intensified the image of evil savages practicing something taboo. Something that's taboo is something that I want to avoid. It's something that I want to put on the side, that I don't want to look at. Uh, and, and because of that reason, I ignore it. Or if I, I'm forced not to ignore it, then I will pass negative judgment toward it and despise those who associate with that sort of religious practice. For those like Tanya who practice voodoo, it is their strong beliefs that bring about an apparent cure. I would say they're not rational beliefs. I mean, they're beliefs that have a strong element of magic, uh, that energy can transfer uh, from an object or a person, uh, either directly or via some symbolic act. It certainly is, is a magical principle that's at work here. There certainly appears to be a sense of desperation that all modern means have been exhausted, and uh, in those cases, we tend to look for the more far-fetched types of solution. 
In voodoo, as in all religions, the faithful assemble for prayer, worship a higher force, and honor a code of ethics. But the voodoo ritual offers its initiates a personal expression not found in mainstream religions. Ritual should never be looked at simply at face value. You have to understand the creative process that is there and that which is being expressed that is very profound uh, in the way in which the individual sees himself or herself in relationship to the world at large. Just as important is the relationship between the practitioner and the priest. The power lies not only within the ritual, but in the credibility of the priest. Those who become credentialized as, as our intermediaries have to show through some act of, uh, not that they essentially have powers that are uh, in excess, but that they have a commitment that they, that we have to believe in them. And once we believe, we give, them, we give ourselves to them. To the skeptic, the idea of an omniscient being and a band of spirits interacting with a devoted following is absurd. There is a kind of arrogance in the belief that here are these very powerful gods who have nothing else to do but take account of our business and to somehow or other have this ongoing interest in our business and uh, will literally uh, lend their ear to our pleas and our arguments and our uh, complaints, if you will. Experts concede the motive behind a practitioner joining voodoo is not as much a quest for spiritual enlightenment as it is a need for identity. Voodoo does provide a sense of ethnic identity. I think the rituals themselves have a way of bringing people together. Uh, they dance together, they sing together, they eat together. Uh, so that uh, religion is a very important, and that is voodoo in, in, in this particular case, is a very important element of social cohesion. The voodoo rituals, not unlike the holiest of Christian rituals, such as baptism or communion, go to the very heart of religious mystery. Questions that concern, you know, with uh, why are we here? These are the most primitive questions that primitive man is. Voodoo no different than Christianity at this level. It addresses the same fears. It addresses the same sets of issues. It addresses them differently. For Chief Alashin, it is his faith in voodoo and his work in the priesthood which keep the mysteries of the rituals alive. I always felt back in my mind that I was a voodoo child, that I come from a place where there is voodoo. Knowing who you are and what you're about is, very, is, is the ultimate in life, to know who you are and to have a definite identity and a role in society is very important for each individual human being. People, human beings all over the world need this. For most of us, voodoo rituals are difficult to grasp. They reflect a culture far removed from Western thought and steeped in mystery. But for Chief Elishin and other voodoo practitioners, their faith embraces these mysteries as a natural component of life itself. Fire. 